Good afternoon. I welcome you all, audience and presenters, to this second in a series of conversations on race and society in Latin America and the Caribbean, organized by the University of Maryland's Latin American Studies Center, LASC. I am Merle Collins, LASC Director. This event is being recorded. For our first discussion in the series, we had representatives of various Latin American organizations. Today, we have three presenters, each of whom will speak initially for 15 minutes, giving us the benefit of their research and expertise. As they present, you may put any questions you have in the Q&A using the feature at the bottom of your screen. You will find biographical details for presenters and moderator in the chat feature. To introduce our presenters and moderate the event, I will yield the virtual floor to Professor Conrad James, who is with us today from the University of Houston where he is Associate Professor of World Cultures and Literatures. He has in the past been a visiting professor here at Maryland, so he's no stranger to UMD. Professor James's research focuses on Spanish Caribbean literature and visual culture and Afro-Hispanic cultural production. Welcome, Professor James. Our thank you, uh, Professor Collins. Our first speaker is Professor Kathleen Lopez from Rutgers University. Her talk today will be on Asians and whiteness in Latin America and the Caribbean. Thank you, everyone. Um, I'd like to first thank Dr. Collins and the Latin American Studies Center and especially Eric Tamala for uh, helping with the logistics of this event. And I want to recognize this wonderful initiative of this series that's inspired by racial events in the United States, but recognizing how these same uh, phenomenon kind of reverberate throughout the Americas, but show up in, in different ways. So I'll begin by sharing um, a short slide presentation. So today I'll, I'll begin with a um, brief overview of the colonial context in which Asians were brought to Latin America and the Caribbean in the 19th century. Then I'll zero in on some of my current research on locally born Chinese across the Caribbean. Large-scale migrations from Asia to the Caribbean, as many of you know, began in the middle of the 19th century, when planters and industrialists sought to supplement or replace African slaves to fuel export economies such as sugar and expand frontiers through railroads and construction. Initially, white European workers were the ones who were sought after, but when they were insufficient in number and proved to be unreliable, colonial merchants and officials turned to indentured or contract laborers from Asia. So from the beginning, conceptuals, co uh, conceptions of racialized labor and whiteness were central to debates on the suitability of Asians. The British government directed labor flows between different nodes of their empire. 500,000 indentured laborers from the Indian subcontinent arrived in the British Caribbean through World War I and another 14,000 from southeastern China. The largest numbers of Chinese indentured laborers, however, were forcibly brought to Cuba and Peru, roughly 250,000 in the 19th century alone. Keep in mind that Chinese immigrants have always constituted a relatively small percentage of regional populations in Latin America and the Caribbean. However, they left a deep imprint on local societies through their concentration in key economic sectors, their small businesses that dotted the landscape, and perhaps most significantly, their unions with local men and women, whites, blacks, and even other Asians. Despite this presence, Chinese have remained largely outside of master narratives and discussions of national identity, 
including mestizaje or racial mixing in Latin American studies and creolization in Caribbean studies. Recent scholarship in history and especially in, in cultural studies has begun to make a real dent in this gap. And I encourage you to all read and, and locate some of this recent, uh, these recent books and scholarship. One commonality across the Americas is that Asians and especially Chinese were legally and culturally marked as perpetual aliens, outsiders against whom national identities were constructed. Images of yellow peril, such as this one from Mexico in the 20th century, circulated throughout the Americas. And anti-Chinese restrictions were imposed across the region through World War II. But these restrictions weren't enforced uniformly, and the colonial um, and post-colonial export economies continued to recruit Asian workers. In general, Latin American elites came to consider miscegenation as a natural means to assimilate a nation's indigenous and African populations. But the same approach did not necessarily apply to Chinese. Government officials from the beginning had no intention for Chinese men to settle. And yellow peril discourses emphasized the debilitating effect that racial mixing of local women with Chinese men would have on a nation's purity. So mixed race children of Chinese were thought to be physically and morally weak, a threat to national culture. Yet from the 19th century onward, Chinese lived and worked alongside local women, often of lo lower social strata. And this produced later generations of multiracial descendants across the Americas. For my current project, I'm looking at the differences as well as interconnections between former Spanish colonies of Cuba and the Dominican Republic, um, and also the British West Indies, especially Jamaica, uh, still under colonial control in the first half of the 20th century. So two examples that I'll touch on today from Jamaica and Cuba demonstrate how whiteness continued to be a central concern. Significantly more females from China settled in the British West Indies than in the former Spanish colonies. In Jamaica, just over a thousand Chinese had arrived in plant, as plantation laborers in the 19th century. So relatively few compared to the, the other Asians that were coming. But a second wave of free migrants in the early 20th century entered and eventually dominated the retail grocery sector on the island. In the 1920s, British colonial officials promoted the immigration of Chinese women to attempt to reduce intermixing with the local population. And by the 1943 census, about 7,000 ethnic Chinese were recorded, almost 60% of whom were born locally. And an additional 5,500 classified as Chinese colored, which included those of mixed African and Asian descent. This influx of Chinese immigrants in the early 20th century coincided with a burgeoning Jamaican national identity. And for certain members of the rising middle class, the children of Chinese, especially women, became potential models of progress and modernity. The Jamaican literary and cultural magazine Planters Punch had been established in 1920 and devoted, devoted its energies toward an upwardly mobile middle class. Its editor, Herbert Delisser, a well-known figure in Jamaican and Caribbean literary history, had, had, had an established reputation as a journalist, travel writer, and novelist. He was of uh, Afro-Jewish descent and part of the merchant class. In addition to serving as editor of the main newspaper in Jamaica, he's known for popularizing locally produced literature and mixed race characters and political themes permeate his historical fiction. Delisser critiqued what he perceived as threats to the autonomy of Jamaican business and a growing middle-class society, which was the British colonial government, as well as Afro-Jamaican working class and their political representatives. And he represents what Belinda Edmondson refers to as middle-brow literary and popular culture of the Anglophone Caribbean, which includes popular novels, beauty pageants, and music festivals. Delisser's newspaper and magazine enjoyed the patronage of the transnational Chinese merchant community in Kingston. 
They regularly advertise their import businesses and retail dry goods and grocery stores. He brought attention to issues confronting Chinese Jamaican retail grocers, which also resonated with Chinese merchant efforts to gain legitimacy across Latin America and the Caribbean at a time when these immigration restrictions were constantly being renewed. As part of a special issue dedicated to Jamaican women in 1929 to 1930, the magazine featured a photo essay on Chinese Jamaican women. Here they are portrayed as civilized, educated, and capable of preserving European sociocultural values as Jamaicans ushered in the new year. Against this implied backdrop of a rising black working class consciousness. Delisser viewed the Chinese merchant class and their children as another near white group with the potential for upward mobility. In his view, local born Chinese would quickly assimilate into Jamaican society within a generation. They were fluent in English, read British literature and belonged to Christian churches. According to his own conversations with Chinese shopkeepers, they did not want to marry Chinese men as they considered their future to be in Jamaica. Um, in this quotation from his essay, Delisser reiterates the promise of the second and later generations for the colony's development. In another 50 years, there, were prob there will probably be no foreign Chinese in Jamaica, which refers to those immigration restrictions. And he ends the quotation, they will help to make the Jamaica of tomorrow. So I want to turn now to uh, neighboring Cuba, where both um, Cuban and Chinese publications echoed these sentiments with a focus on the Chinese male dominated business community and their mixed families. Images of their unions with respectable or white Cuban women sent a message, message of assimilation. So this is an image of just a typical um, upper tier Chinese import shop. Um, and these uh, women may be either wives or relatives um, or simply workers in the shop. Uh, Chinese retail grocers founded a new magazine called Fraternidad, which helped to outwardly project an image of the Chinese as integrated into Cuban society and as an essential component of Cuban national identity. This magazine had a separate section in Spanish in order to reach a non-Chinese audience, as well as a generation of locally born Chinese who wouldn't be able to necessarily read Chinese characters. The Spanish section featured prominent Chinese and Cubans in the society pages. So you see photos of weddings to white Cuban women and baptisms of second generation children, all of this underscoring Chinese integration into Cuban society and national culture. And what's visibly absent from the pages are Afro-Cuban women who we know from other records had a, a high rate of intermarriage with Chinese, including Chinese merchants. Um, so many Chinese subscribed, especially of this upper tier, subscribed to prevalent racial thinking in Cuba. And they were confident that their class position would confer an honorary white status upon them. In the post-war period, for example, we see Chinese petitioning the courts to have their children's birth certificates changed from mestizo or mixed to white and thereby reinforcing existing racial hierarchies. However, there were some mixed Afro-Chinese Cubans who gravitated toward Afro-Cuban social and political spheres, especially when they were not included in these kinds of spaces. So for example, Club Atenas was founded in Havana in 1917 as a civic and cultural association for African descended people in Republican Cuba. At a time when racial discrimination was prevalent in Cuban society, this club provided an important social space, but also a space for political advocacy. And by 1950, its president was the son of a Chinese, Evelio Chan Mesa. So this kind of upper middle class Afro-Cuban organization could offer a space for mixed men of Chinese descent and for their children. 
Um, I want to conclude these uh, two examples from my research and project with an image of a Chinese bodega in Cuba and to kind of contrast this to the earlier image of the um, Chinese porcelain and silk shop. Across the Caribbean, despite elite discourses of whiteness and upward mobility, these kinds of corner shops, which you find in Cuba, you find in Jamaica, um, everywhere, became fixtures in local communities and spaces for mixing with local populations. And as we know, later generations of Afro-Chinese Caribbeans became deeply involved in national and decolonial projects. Thank you very much. Okay, our next speaker will be Professor Silvio Torres Sayan from Syracuse University, who will talk on race in Hispaniola. Silvio. Thank you, Conrad. Wonderful to see you. And wonderful to, uh, and thank you, um, Merrill, for this invitation. The rest of the team, Eric, can be on the team in general, and the and my colleagues. Uh, who are also speakers. Um, so um, what I like to say, um, I begin by saying that Hispaniola um, is difficult to study uh, from the point of view of, of race, race relations. Um, it is a, it's a difficult place to study because most people who approach it, approach it uh, somehow already knowing that uh, what to find. And as a result, they find what they thought they would find. Uh, they tend not to come with a, um, you know, uh, with, a, with an openness to discover what might be there that might uh, not correspond to what they thought uh, was there. And so um, I think a good example of this is, um, if you look at uh, the first chapter of the documentary Black in Latin America, with my uh, colleague, uh, my colleague uh, Skip Gates, um, who opens actually with this very sharp contrast between uh, these two populations of the island. He goes to the river, to the Massacre River, uh, which, which divides these. Uh, at, at, at one point, where the the one point where Massacre River divides. Uh, becomes the, uh, the the sort of natural border, um, and he makes contrastive claims about what's in this place, what's in the other place. This place, they, you know, it's uh, seven it's seven seven a.m. This other is eight a.m. Uh, in this place, they are uh, embrace their uh, African heritage. In this place, uh, in this other place, they. Um, uh, treasure their uh, Spanish um, heritage, and so on. Um, and and you often find. Um, I remember before uh, some of us entered, uh, sort of fought our way into the U.S. Academy. Um, there were books uh, that were that, that, that would that would speak about race of the island, uh, and would chastise Dominicans uh, for their reticence. Uh, to accept their blackness, um, and there's one, and there's one by a very distinguished African American professor, uh, who, when speaking about the, um, the, uh, the the rebellions that were taking place at the end of the 18th century, uh, in Sandomang, uh, says, and uh, as, as a kind of uh, as a kind of uh, revelation that, uh, that there was even impact. On the, on the eastern side of the island where uh, rebellions began to be. Um, and that actually uh, triggered uh, my curiosity. Why is this? Why, why does this happen? Um, so let me just say, let me read a passage from, um, from a piece uh, and then I'll proceed with my, with my index uh, cards. Um, the bibli bibliography on slavery and the struggle for freedom and equality among the African descended population of the Americas 
rarely acknowledges the Spanish colony of Santo Domingo as the inaugural site where the struggle for black liberation began. Um, this may be due to the greater magnitude of the struggle against the colonial order that took place on the same island, the western uh, third of it, in the late 18th century, a time when, as, um, as a result of Spain's abandonment of that part of the island, the French colony of Saint-Domingue had emerged there. The Saint-Domingue insurrection, which started in 1791, and culminated in the dismantling of the colonial regime, creating the Republic of Haiti in 1804, challenged the political, economic, and moral foundation of the Christian West, which at the time owed its material well being to the slave based economy that the colonial transaction had created. Given the global impact of the events on, French, on, the, on the French colony, scholars have tended to overlook the history of the struggle of blacks suffering captivity on the island under the Spanish. Uh, an epic story spanning two and a half centuries prior to the 1791 uprisings against the French regime in Saint-Domingue and through the fifth decade of the 19th century. So um, the, um, the problem with, um, I recall in one of our planning uh, conversations, um, uh, Professor Collins uh, identifying um, identifying whiteness as a um, the problem of whiteness as an underlying theme, right? Uh, sort of a, across our various uh, ideas that we have proposed for for this conversation. Um, so white supremacy is an issue, uh, and uh, white supremacy is an issue throughout the entire hemisphere. Um, and it doesn't matter what the phenotype of the majority of the population in any particular spot in the hemisphere, a white supremacy continues to be a major, a major issue. Um, not, not one, I don't, I don't know that there is one particular spot that escapes the problem of whiteness, irrespective of, of how, of what the phenotype of the population might be. Um, so you know, if you those of you who know Cuba uh, know the, the the difficulties with Cuba. I mean, the, the famous example of uh, of these social scientists in the 1930s uh, trying to establish uh, that although uh, you know since uh, Antonio Maceo, the great liberator uh, in the Cuban independence uh, war, um, that uh, since everyone deemed him admirable. There was no way not to admire him, um, and you know, the, in particular, the, they agreed that he was a great man. So research began to try to establish what his real ancestry is. So they went to his uh, to the cemetery and uh, unearthed his uh, remains to do a study of him. Uh, and this study, uh, which was led by um, uh, these uh, distinguished social scientists, um, Jose R. Montalvo Covarrubias, Carlos de la Torre, and Luis Montaneda de, um, they sought permission from the, from the family um, uh, to, to disinter his body. Uh, let, let me uh, correct one detail. They actually did this in 1899, uh, one year after the, the, uh, the, US, the arrival of the US on, on, on the island. After, uh, so after the, the, the detailed study of every crevice of the Re revolutionary warrior's skull, the scholars could find comfort in their findings. For even though, quote, many anthropological characteristics, comma, would, uh, I'm sorry, quotation, close quotation, would, would place Maceo in the black type, he was closer to the white race so that they could scientifically affirm that Maceo indeed may be considered a superior man. What's more, they, uh, they now knew the reason, whiteness. They could establish Maceo's close proximity to the white race, thereby confirming the premise underlying their study, namely that the crossing of whites and blacks 
produces an advantageous group when the confluence of the former predominates, uh, uh, pr predominates but an inferior group when the two influences balance each other and even more so when the black influence exceeds the white. Yeah? So basically, in the end, uh, yes, he was exteriorly a, uh, a black man, but when it comes to the, uh, the, the, the talents that really matter, he actually was a white man. That should not be seen as scandalous. Uh, the um, Negrophobia in the, in, the, in, the, in the Caribbean and in Latin America in general, yeah? but in the Caribbean, uh, created uh, this kind of thaumaturgic, magical thought. Uh, in the most learned people. Um, and I like to just mention one case in Santo Domingo because I find it uh, compelling. Um, there's a, a journalist uh, who in 1907, uh, his name is, uh, he's a, he's a journalist, uh, an author, diplomat. Um, uh, and he writes uh, in 1907, uh, a general guide and directory to the country, to the Dominican Republic. Um, beginning of the 20th century, you know, modernity on its way. Uh, gringos are coming in to build the, rail, the railroad and, and stuff like that. Yeah. A, uh, so a general guide and directory to Dominican society for the benefit of visitors published in 1907 by, by journalist, educator, and diplomat uh, Enrique Deschamps um, offers a telling illustration of the racial thinking and feeling then. In the section of the guia, guia yeah, uh, was a guide that evokes the early years of the colony of Santo Domingo. The Shan cites the handsomeness of the Tainos. So there is a tendency, there's a tendency among uh, the, the, that generation, that generation and subsequent generations of, um, of the literati in the Dominican Republic that identifies much with the uh, with the plight of the Tainos, what happened to them without, at the same time, you know, there's a, a great deal of, uh, it's a great deal of acrobatics involved, mental acrobatics, without ever uh, condemning uh, systemically uh, the colonial uh, encroachment of, of Spain into, into the island. Uh, so they, they um, so with, he describes their bodies uh, with, Beautiful and attractive fi figures, fine and soft skin, despite the dark color. Yeah? This is the moment in which he's, uh, he's, uh, he is identifying with what happened to the Tainos uh, and finds them beautiful, yeah? But he finds them beautiful despite their color. Um, on the imported African, of the imported African workers, he says that, comma, I'm sorry, comma, sorry, I keep, uh, I don't know why I'm doing that, um, quotation marks, in spite of the abuses, uh, speaking now of the enslaved African population in Santo Domingo, in spite of the abuses to which their captivity made them victims, and although the number of males among them exceeded that of the females, the African race, contrary to the indigenous population, multiplied rapidly, deriving, and, and, and note this, this emphasis, deriving physical and moral advantages from their crossing with European and indigenous races with which they immediately came into contact. This is a telling moment because of its uh, thaumaturgic nature, the, the, the magical nature. Because uh, in that same, uh, Pass in that same area of the of the, of the Gia, he actually is indicting the abusive tr treatment uh, to which um, the uh, the slave to, to which the, uh, the settlers and the colonizers uh, subjected uh, the captive population. Um, so um, he speaks of of the of the uh, enslaved blacks as uh, of the uh, of the treatment by white masters. Uh, the treatment, to, the treatment to which white masters subjected their enslaved blacks as inhumane and shameful. Um, and so the reader uh, will find it hard to figure out how, what could, 
what could possibly qualify such depraved merchants of human flesh yeah, and abuse to pass on moral advantages to their captives? Yeah? From which I derive the notion that strange as it may sound, the answer seems to be the whiteness of the skin itself contained the superior morality irrespective of the depraved conduct of the, of the individual whose flesh is under that skin. Yeah? Um, so race thinking is, has been complicated. Um, it has been complicated in, um, in uh, Dominican Republic as well as uh, in Haiti. You may recall that when the revolution triumphed, the Saint Domingue revolution, a triumph, and um, within a couple of years after surviving, after defeating, beating the heck out of the uh, largest uh, deployment of, of soldiers overseas in, in modern times, yeah? um, after surviving the Napoleonic invasion, um, they created a republic in, in, in 1804. Uh, and so they chose uh, their the official religion. The official religion was not the religion that had informed the warriors who made victory possible. It was the religion of the people who came on the invasion. The, basically, it was the Catholic religion. Um, and um, you should also know that French became the language. In fact, uh, not, not Vaudou, which had been the language of the people who, who, who built uh, Haiti out of Saint Domingue. Yeah? Um, in fact, um, Vaudou, uh, first, um, first uh, Creole would not become a formal language, uh, formally accepted, right? An official language until the first uh, government of uh, Jean Bertrand Aristide in um, 1987. And, um, um, and, uh, and, and Vodou would not become an official religion until the first decade of the uh, present century. Now, what does that say about Negrophobia uh, in, uh, in, uh, in Haiti itself? Um, we, we know from uh, uh, Brenda Gale Plummer's uh, essential book, um, Haiti and the Great Powers uh, from uh, 1902 to 1915, um, that it, it became um, that you could go from rags to riches overnight. If you came from uh, Belgium, Spain, uh, a European country, and you brought your whiteness with you as a, as a single male, and you made yourself um, available uh, for marriage with one of the uh, daughters of the bourgeoisie. Uh, and, 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 and that way, many people who had been nobody uh, in Europe became somebody in Haiti. But one disarming thing that, uh, that uh, Professor Plummer uh, notes there is that quite often, and, and of course, uh, by, marrying, by marrying into, their, into a Haitian family, they would also become Haitian citizens and would be able to uh, transact business uh, in the name of Haiti, which they did. And quite often they pursued commerce um, uh, treaties with their countries of origin and invariably uh, in a manner that benefited their countries of origin and uh, worked to the disadvantage of Haiti itself. You should know, for instance. I mean, this is not this is not a secret, but uh, the the the, uh, the the history of banking in the, in Haiti begins with uh, with the French bank, yeah? um, and this, of course, um, also um, connects to a question that uh, <clears throat> that I was asked once. I think uh, I think it may have been that conference that uh, that uh, Conrad. And, uh, and, and, and Merle put together, uh, somebody from the audience uh, 
when when uh, we speak, we're speaking about the um, the concessions that uh, the Haitian authorities uh, may agreed to to basically uh, refund refund France for the expenditures uh, of the Napoleonic invasion and for the loss of um, and for the loss of the plantation economy that they had there. And, and recall, um, uh, Saint Domingue had be, had been uh, before it was dismantled uh, as as a plantation economy uh, had been the most lucrative overseas enterprise, uh, more lucrative than all other French overseas enterprises put together. Yeah, so this was a major economic an economic blow. Right? I mean. Shortly, that, shortly thereafter, Napoleon, Napoleon is, uh, is uh, persuaded to sell Louisiana to, uh, to, to President Jefferson uh, and, uh, and, and, and severely diminishes, uh, practically ends uh, French power in, in North America. Um, so um, I'm thinking of what does that, what does that mean? Uh, that, you know, that one can paint a picture, one can paint a picture of a, uh, of contrast between the Meg Republic uh, and uh, and Haiti, um, I recall reading uh, reading um, C. L. R. James' uh, famous book, uh, the most famous of C. L. R. James' books, uh, the Black Jacobins, in which he kind of pokes fun <laughs> at this um, Haitian ambassador uh, in France uh, in the nineteen thirties, who with apparent conviction affirms that there is um, no difference at all between French and Haitian culture. Yeah? Um, and I don't know, I mean, uh, during the uh, invasion of, um, of Haiti uh, in 1915, before the invasion of the Dominican Republic the following year, yeah? Um, it became uh, it became clear that whiteness uh, would uh, would rule the day there. Um, Jean Price Mars. It is in that context that Jean Price Mars uh, writes his his book on Si par la Longue, which is uh, whose 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 mission primarily is to establish the African rootedness of Haitian culture. Um, and, and, and you would think from the Dominican Republic, Dominican Negrophobes uh, basically look at Haiti and they see Africa. And by seeing Africa in Haiti, they don't have to see it in themselves. Um, uh, but but, but, but um, Mars was not, Price Mars was not trying to convince foreigners. He was trying to convince his own countrymen, yeah? And that, to me, says something about the difficulty of, of race uh, in the region. Um, so I, I don't, I don't know. Um, I mean, um, the uh, wonderful. Uh, yes. Okay. So uh, I have. Uh, that means is that my clue? <laughs> okay. I, I, I can cut right there. I've never thought, as you well know, I never thought that I have that I have that what I have to say, what I still have to say, is in any way better than what I've said already. Uh, so, so happy to end here. Thank you. Thank you, Silvio. Our final speaker is Professor Patricia Pino from UC Santa Cruz, who will speak on whiteness and Brazil's reactionary wave. Patricia. Thank you. Thank you so much. Just give me one second to um, put up the slides. So I'd like to start by thanking Professor Mo Collins for this lovely invitation. It's great to be here with colleagues whose work I really admire. And also thanks for the whole team in the last um, office for putting together the event. Um, I also want to uh, thank, before I begin, I want to thank the Research Center for the Americas and the Santa Cruz Institute for Social Transformation here at the University of California, Santa Cruz, for supporting our research cluster 
called um, Researching and Resisting Brazil's Reactionary Wave. So we put together this cluster right after the election of Bolsonaro in 2018. And it has been a really important source of inspiration. And in fact, the, the work I'm going to share here today um, was inspired by the cluster. So what I'm going to be sharing, um, part of this current research that I'm doing will be published in a book chapter um, in this book that will be coming out. Hopefully, uh, the timeline is um, next year, 2021, by Rutgers University Press. And the book is called Precarious Democracy, Ethnographies of Hope, Despair, and Resistance in Brazil after the pink tide. So as you know, um, in October 2018, Brazil elected a neo-fascist president, a proud homophobe, an explicitly racist, misogynist, um, reactionary uh, man as president of the country. And since then, we have all been scrambling to make sense of how did this happen? How come Brazil elected someone like this? So um, what I have seen from most of the analysis is really a set of different propensities that's what I'm calling these kind of um, in, um, elements that have propelled the current reactionary wave. So some scholars have emphasized um, the role of sexism and misogyny. Others have emphasized homophobia, racism, class resentment, religious fundamentalism. And I, my um, take on this is that all of these elements have indeed played a significant role in the rise of the right in Brazil, of the far right, and ultimately in the election of Bolsonaro. And um, what is important to emphasize is that all of these propellers have been um, incentivized by fear. So, um, and this is actually, I'm gonna be referring here to several scholars. One of them um, is actually a uh, uh, congressman, the first openly gay congressman in Brazil, Jean Willis, who because of the number of death threats and attacks, he had to actually flee the country, uh, re uh, resign from his post and he's actually in exile. And he makes a really good point about um, how these different constituencies were mobilized by different kinds of fear. So he says Bolsonaro's campaign mobilized distinct kinds of fear of the so-called internal enemy um, to, uh, for different constituencies. And um, Rosana Pinheiro Machado and Lucia Scalco uh, make a similar point when they say that um, Bolsonaro's campaign and the rise of the right in general in Brazil has, um, ha has been a due to a great extent to this fear of this so-called internal enemy. So it's interesting to have listened to Professor Lopez talk about the external enemy when, you know, thinking about the Chinese and the Caribbean. In the case of Brazil, the fear has been predominantly of the so-called internal enemy, which Pinheiro Machado and Scalco usually talk about as an empty signal which can be filled as um, in the following way. Um, if you want to mobilize fear among religious fundamentalists, then the internal enemy, uh, you know, the LGBTQ community. If you want to install fear, uh, instill fear among the a traditional middle class that was resentful with the rise of the poor during the PT's administrations, which I'll talk about in a second, then the internal enemy uh, are the, those who were the beneficiaries of income distribution policies or the um, criminal, the bandido, the marginal, as, um, as the, the terms are, are used in Brazil. Um, so I, I wanted to lay out these propellers to say, I agree that all of these propellers are very important, but what I think has been missing from this analysis is the role of whiteness. So how has whiteness contributed also to propel the reactionary wave in Brazil? And before I even talk about that, I wanted to just very quickly contextualize that this um, current moment we're living in Brazil is very much, um, the result of a huge backlash to the 13 years in which the Workers' Power, the Workers' Party was in power from 2000, 2003 through 2016. So four consecutive presidencies of the PT, the Partido dos Trabalhadores, the Workers' Party. And given that the fourth term in the presidential's office was actually um, cut short by an institutional coup d'etat that removed 
from the presidency, Dilma Rousseff, Brazil's first female president. So during this, these 13 years, um, significant changes occurred in Brazil, including um, the uh, um, uplifting of 40 million Brazilians from the lower classes to the lower middle classes, um, affirmative action in higher education through the format of racial quotas, um, domestic workers' rights also being implemented. So significant changes that create a lot also of class resentment. And this has been one of the concepts um, used to analyze what's going on in Brazil. But I would say that class alone is not enough to um, account for this. Along with class and the, the resentment of the traditional middle class, I think we need to also analyze whiteness. So what I'd like to do in these I guess 10 minutes I have left, is very briefly to define whiteness and then discuss a little bit these two concepts that I'm developing to, to understand whiteness in this context. Injured whiteness and this concept I'm using mostly to um, account for you know, the class resentment of the traditional middle class. And then aspirational whiteness is a concept that I'm developing to try to explain the role of whiteness among the lower classes. And even though I thought originally this would be an opportunity for me to study up, as Silvio just mentioned, white supremacy you know, is a project that not only um, exists across the hemisphere, but also it crosses the boundaries of social classes and racial groups. So um, I'm using, I'm developing aspirational whiteness as a concept to then try to account for whiteness um, among the lower classes and the role it has played in the context of the reactionary wave. So um, one of the things I wanted to say from the beginning before I even begin to define whiteness in Brazil is to say that whiteness studies has grown significantly in Brazil, especially since the 90s. Um, and to a great extent, it has been influenced by um, critical whiteness studies in the United States. But I really do not want us to think of whiteness studies in Brazil as an offshoot of whiteness studies in the US. It is its own thing. So whiteness studies in Brazil has developed significantly, um, especially since the 90s, and in, in a dialogue with um, whiteness studies in other countries, the US, South Africa, the UK, but not really limited, not, not really, it should not be seen as a, a kind of offshoot. So some of the pioneers of the studies of whiteness in Brazil were actually from the field of social psychology. So Maria Aparecida Silva Bento, for instance, defines whiteness as a social identity of whites, as neutral, universal. Edith Pisa, also in, from the field of psychology, talks about um, whiteness as a dominant identity, normative, invisible, preferential. More recent research on whiteness, um, especially done by anthropologists, and I want to mention here Valeria Ribeiro Corosax and, and Susana Maia, um, they have really made the point that because of the myth of racial democracy and ideas of mestizaging in Brazil, it's very important to understand how whiteness operates through other registers that are not always explicitly racial, um, but are implicitly so, like morality, respectability, worthiness, intimacy, etc. Um, more recent research also, um, such as Jennifer Roth Gordon's, um, has focused on the performance of whiteness through linguistic discipline, through embodied practices. I think that all of these definitions are very important and again, complementary. But I also, I think that to study whiteness in the context of the reactionary wave, it is important to understand whiteness as an ideal that is promoted discursively as a major social value to be preserved by those who already possess it, thus the injured whiteness, who, you know, those who feel they were losing their whiteness, and then acquired by those who do not. And this is where the aspirational whiteness comes into play. So I want to spend a little bit of time talking about each one of these two concepts. Um, and I'm going to read a bit so that I don't lose track of time. So 
similar to the concept of injured masculinity, injured whiteness results from a crisis of a dominant model due to a change in the status quo and a real or perceived loss of power and privilege of the dominant group. The challenge to the long-standing premise that poor and black people should know their place, both physically and symbolically, deeply mobilized the already existing fear of otherness, no longer be because the other meant an external threat to the self, but because the other was threatening to become the self during the PT era. Um, so more than ever before in the history of Brazil, whiteness was interpolated to think here of Stuart Hall's contribution to the studies of identity. Um, so no longer whiteness was the dominant universal neutral identity that interpolated others, but for the very first time, it, it was itself being interpolated. And I would say of all of these transformations of the um, Workers' Party's um, presidencies, affirmative action probably is the, of all of the policies, the one that had the major impact in this interpolation of whiteness. And then, of course, if we are talking about a, a country where slavery was the, the last to, uh, to be abolished, um, it's important that in the specific context of Brazil, the ideal of whiteness should be also understood in light of this long history of slavery. And to remember that this profound history of slavery shaped Brazilian society, culture, and politics, and also <coughs> that um, slave, being a slave owner was not just the privilege of a few in Brazil. Um, small property owners, merchants, and even former slaves owned slaves in Brazil. So the legacy of slavery continues to inform uh, this reach, this um, racial hierarchy that encompasses the belief in white superiority and black and uh, inferiority, the association between blackness and manual labor, and the notion that black and poor people should know their place both physically and symbolically. Um, so all of that, I think, helps explain to some extent how injured whiteness um, has played out in the context of the reactionary wave. But because whiteness operates discursively, it is not restricted to the groups that most directly benefit from it. And in fact, as I was saying before, originally I thought this is an opportunity for me to study up, but the more I began to analyze whiteness in the reactionary wave, the more I realized how it permeates different social classes and even different um, racial groups, which is why then the concept of aspirational whiteness is useful to reflect upon how whiteness performs as this ideal across um, social classes. Um, and I think it also helps to understand why and pay attention to these numbers. I'm not a quantitative scholar, but these numbers are quite shocking. 45% of Black Brazilians, 45% of Black Brazilians, and 64% of Brazilians whose families receive between two and five minimum wages voted for Bolsonaro. So if we are to understand whiteness in this context, we have to see how it operates also among the lower classes. So you know, there's, a, uh, there's this whole discussion of the fear of the internal enemy that I mentioned before. And I would say, yes, there's definitely, that has definitely played an important role. And this fear of the internal enemy has been important to preserve class and racial boundaries between the poor and the rich, blacks and whites, but also to produce boundaries among the poor and among non-whites. And that has been done through a process of deliberate disidentification from the so-called internal enemy, from the bandido marginal, from uh, you know the criminal who are implicitly or stereotypically imagined as black and male, um, a deliberate disidentification from the beneficiaries of income distribution programs or members of social movements like the landless movement, etc. So what we have seen then uh, throughout this process is actually two opposite processes regarding whiteness among the lower classes. On the one hand, a growing desire for whiteness. And I think that a major um, element that I am trying to bring in this chapter is to think about how 
to think of fear, we also need to think about desire in this context. So it's fear of the internal enemy, fear of being mistaken for the internal enemy, but also a desire for whiteness. And this has played out through the mobilization of fear, the incentive to consume, which was also a significant part of the presidencies, the administrations of the Workers' Party. So um, consumerism, not just the, the right to consume, the ability to consume, but consumerism across the board was very uh, disseminated as well. Prosperity theology is another major um, component in this process, even though we tend to think of prosperity theology as something that exists among neo-Pentecostal realms, it's important to understand that these um, uh, philosophies, if we want to call it that, they, they are not restricted to those who practice specific religions. They become disseminated um, beyond the walls of neo-Pentecostal churches. And then neoliberal subjectivity, especially in, in a context in which we see incredibly uh, an, incre uh, an increasing number of um, self-exploited workers, uh, we see precarity across the board, but you know, uh, Uber and Lyft um, uh, drivers being told that they are entrepreneurs and not, in fact, overexploited workers without protection. So that's also part of how neoliberal subjectivities have played out. But then on one hand, then we see this growing desire for whiteness among the lower classes. But on the other hand, we have also seen a denunciation of white privilege, an overcoming of whiteness as an ideal, and this reclaiming of blackness as a dignified identity. And the picture that you see here um, on the screen is um, of Susanne Silva alongside Juma Rousseff when she was still president, but the coup process had already began. And the sign that Susanne Silva, she, she was a medical student at the time, the sign that she is holding roughly translates to the slave masters freak out when the, when the slaves become doctors. And so, and this slogan became very widespread across Brazil. Uh, different versions um, include um, the slave masters freak out when the slaves learn to read, for example. And this was really a way of outing whiteness, of calling out white, uh, whiteness and, and white privilege, and, and really pointing to this reactionary um, performance of whiteness as, um, as black, black Brazilians were entering the lower middle classes, and in some cases, the lower classes. So it's very important to also analyze how um, this, um, you know, so we don't just see a, a an identification with whiteness, but also um, a, a disidentification in some cases. And I'm saying this also because I wanna end with a more positive note. Um, so to conclude, I would just say that uh, now that we are almost halfway through Bolsonaro's tragic administration, marked by a deep neglect toward the poor, continuous attacks on Afro-Brazilians, indigenous communities and sexual minorities, skyrocketing unemployment, and with over 160,000 Brazilian deaths due to COVID, these two opposing processes have continued to deepen among the lower classes. But the increasing grassroots mobilization taking place in Brazil, exemplified by the movements in the favelas in which uh, um, favela dwellers have taken it upon themselves to fight COVID, um, the domestic workers campaign to protect themselves during the pandemic, and also the record number of black candidates in the upcoming municipal elections. And these are not just phenotypically black candidates, but candidates engaged in anti-racist struggles. This Wonderful. Yeah, I'm one, one sentence and I'll be done. This seems to indicate that the latter process may be dominating over the former. Among the middle and upper classes who, like their own whiteness, are more hidden in their enclaves, if the way they have fiercely held on to their domestic workers during the pandemic, sometimes even subjecting them to just live in their households so that they are not you know, um, vectors of contamination. Um, if that is any indication, then we still have a long way to go toward abolishing whiteness in Brazil. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thanks to our, our three speakers.
Uh, you can all come on camera now. Um, we have just uh, on the half an hour to address questions or to develop um, our ideas first. So I'll just read the questions as I see them. Then there's one here for Silvio. So I'll just, Sil Silvio, this is, is for you, I'll read it. It says, Maceo's proximity to whiteness because of his talent, uh, I don't want, I didn't get that right, should not be seen as a bad thing and not given to whiteness that superior to your mantra. Oh. How do you explain the same phenomenon looking at Maroon? This is a question I, I, I presume the early bit was quoting you or attempting to quote. It says, how do you explain the same phenomenon looking at Maroon leaders from uh, known throughout the Caribbean? And it says, some text suggests that Haitians used not Catholic rituals before their war of independence, but syncretic rit rituals born from the symbiosis of Catholic rituals and African religious rituals that have survived. Why the emphasis only on Catholic rituals? So that's a two part for you, Silvio. I think I, I, I refer specifically to the Catholic, to the uh, adoption of, the, uh, of Catholicism as the official religion of the country, a country uh, who's, um, who became possible uh, through uh, the efforts of people who were who were primarily practitioners of Odu. Okay. Uh, all right. Um, there's another question here for you, Silvio. It says, in your estimation, what are the successes and failures of Norism in in Haiti? The, the, are you speaking about the current uh, government? It, it seems so. Yeah, That's unfortunately, right. I, I must confess, I'm not up on current uh, political history in, uh, in Haiti. Um, I, 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 often, I often the link for a period. Okay. Both, both, both from the Dominican Republic as well. I the link uh, because it hurts too much. So uh, when I feel stronger, I come back to it. Good. Okay, now here is a question for Patrick, for, for, for Professor Pino. What role did religion play in the fear of growing desire for whiteness? Yeah, well, I think a, a way of thinking about this question, um, which thank you is a really important question, um, is to think about whiteness again, not just as a phenotypical um, uh, expression, but to, so, so, you know, to think of whiteness is also to think about moral values, right? Which is why I, I began with that definition of whiteness um, and, and whiteness as this ideal that is pursued. So it's not only about physically um, whitening one's appearance, for instance, which I think is also very important, but I think most studies have actually gone in that direction previously. Um, so if we, if we are then to think about whiteness as um, an ideal to be pursued, the way I think um, neo-Pentecostal um, liberation theology has intensified that uh, through several ways. One is really by emphasizing individualism, by emphasizing um, and, and, and even um, creating a, a connection, a, a form of identification to Bolsonaro himself as a candidate. He ran under the slogan, uh, Brazil acima de tudo, Deus acima de todos, which is like Brazil above all else and God above everyone else, I guess, the translation. So he ran on a very hypocrite hypocritical, I should say, um, a, a appeal to Christianity. Um, and, and actually, he, he, he kind of plays to all of his different constituencies because he himself is a Catholic, he's married to an evangelical um, wife. Um, so it's interesting how he also 
mobilizes these different um, religious affiliations that he has. Um, so, uh, so, so I, I would really emphasize the moral, the, the moralistic appeal of his campaign, and, and especially the notion of the heteronormative family. So the whole issue of the familia brasileira, the Brazilian family as a heteronormative couple with children um, under threat, um, quote unquote, by um, you know, the, the LGBTQ community is really important. And if I should just mention those who did not follow um, the elections in Brazil, um, the Bolsonaro campaign even made, made up a lie that the Workers' Party, if the Workers' Party came to power, which is ridiculous because it had already been in power, um, but if they did come to power again, they would actually um, offer sex education to children, but they would do so from the moment kids were infants in daycare centers and to the point that they would use um, a baby bottle in the shape of a penis. So that, as ridiculous as it sounds, that played an important role in, and I'm, I'm in WhatsApp groups, so I saw a lot of these, you know, fake news coming in and people really believing in them. So I would say um, this moralistic appeal is, um, was an important part of the mobilization of fear, and it really played a very important role in um, getting him elected, ultimately. Okay, thank you. Now, there, there is a question uh, for, for Silvio um, concerning how you, what your explanation would be or your understanding is of the economic and political dominance of Middle Eastern uh, minorities in Hispaniola and their relationship to whiteness. Well, clearly they, uh, they arrived uh, late 19th century and then continued to arrive into the early 20th century. And, uh, and they came with a merchant uh, culture. Or, I know they, they had uh, resources, um, found opportunities. Uh, they started from nothing in, in, in most cases. They did not come with capital. Uh, but uh, it, is, it is true that there being Middle Easterners uh, enabled them to uh, get to uh, acquire a space in the Dominican economy. Um, and um, I mean, I remember uh, we speak of Turcos in the, in, in the Dominican Republic. Turcos meaning uh, anything the, uh, a Turco is not somebody from Turkey. <laughs> a Turco is somebody who comes from, who is either Arab, Arab, Arab or, or, or Jewish, or you know, comes either from Israel or from, uh, or from the uh, Arab uh, world. And they came in and, and, and they settled and, they did, did well, and so the the thing with with whiteness is that they actually uh, be, uh, they actually accepted as whites. Yeah. Okay, um, I'm going to move on to a, a question for Professor Pino. But just before that, there's a, a, a sort of related question for for uh, Silvio, which asks whether we can think uh, of Obama's whiteness as something that was used to mitigate his African heritage, this person wants to find out. Or in other words, I'm reading, to say that he was not quite that black, or would you read how Obama um, has been read in the US in different terms? And then we'll move on to a question. No, uh, my, my reading of the, of the political discourse at the time was that this Obama was, was marketed as the first black president. Mm. And so the, uh, the, the affirmation of, of his blackness, and many people would say his marriage, his, 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 uh, his marriage to a woman who was discernibly black, yeah, um, makes, it, made him, makes him a, a black man. Um, I, I think his, uh, Obama is just a strategist and, and he, he knows how to be I think something connected with what uh, Professor Pina was, was talking about. I mean, he knows how to speak in a manner that sort of uh, escapes the assumptions about you know, what a black person does when they, when they speak. Uh, and so, they, they, you know, I'm not gonna say that he has uh, embraced a, a kind of aspirational of whiteness uh, but in, his, in, his, in his performance, uh, but he, you know, he does feel uh, 
not as threatening as such as Jesse Jackson. <laughs> okay. Okay. There, there is a question for, for, for Professor Pena, uh, Pena, Patricia, asking about your imprint, your ideas about the role of memory in, um, in understanding whiteness in Brazil. Yeah, I, I saw that question. I'm not really sure what it what that means. So if, if perhaps whoever posed the question would like to elaborate a bit, because what what memory memory of what exactly? So I'd be happy to, if the question could be perhaps a little bit more specific. Um, there is another question though before that one oh. about the appeal of whiteness among non-whites. Can I? Okay. Uh, yes. Respond to that one, yeah. And and I think that's a really important question. The question is, let me see if I can summarize it. Um, let's see where it is. Yeah, I for some reason I can't find it right now. But the question I'm is really as well. yeah. about the appeal of whiteness among non-whites, um, and I think that's a really important question because again. Um, because whiteness is a discursive, operates as a discursive configuration, we really have to look at it in different social classes and different racial groups. Um, and and so, yeah, I think the question was about how this disidentification from the internal enemy can also be a survival strategy. And I am in complete agreement with that. And I would actually point the person who asked the question to two books that I think analyze that really well. Um, one is uh, Jaime Amparo Alves's Anti-Black City, in which he really talks about the bandido homem de bem kind of binary, like you are either, especially for people who are non-white and poor, the constant suspicion that they are, you know, there's carrying this burden around that your body elicits suspicion is something that people have to to deal with on, on a daily basis. And so disidentifying from blackness or disidentifying from the stereotypical image of the bandido, um, of the criminal is really a survival strategy. And then I want to point folks to Jennifer Roth Gordon's book on um, uh, whiteness in Brazil, because you know when she talks about um, the performance, the bodily performances of whiteness that many times uh, non-white impoverished youth engage in and also how they do that through linguistic practices you know trying to speak kind of standard Portuguese because otherwise the way they speak Portuguese can reveal their um, class and, and racial affiliation. Um, I think those are very important examples of how people um, engage in these perf daily performances as a survival strategy, especially when they are faced by, you know, encounters with the police, encounters with authority figures, etc. So uh, I absolutely um, want to recognize that, um, how many times this plays, this does play out as a survival strategy, yes. Okay, thank you, Patricia. Now we have a question that uh, is inviting response of both uh, uh, Silvio and Professor Lopez, which basically suggests that there has been more dynamism in the study of, of blackness in the Caribbean than there has been of whiteness. And the, the person asks, how might we give more precise characteristics to whiteness in the Caribbean that can acknowledge a hemispheric white supremacy, but also be at to regional difference. Let's ask for both Kathleen and Silvio to address that. Uh, I'll let Kathleen go. Um, okay, I'll, I'll start. Uh, that's actually a fantastic question, and I think gets at the heart of what we're trying to do at this in this panel by, you know, linking the different presentations. And I would say yes, in in light of uh, Professor Pino's presentation, you know, using. Uh, theoretical constructions of uh, from critical whiteness studies it can absolutely be applied to uh, the, the case studies from the Caribbean uh, that I'm working on. In particular, this idea that um, the, the kind of social constructedness of whiteness through concepts such as morality, respectability, discipline, uh, the very same uh, newspaper editor, Herbert Delisser, who was advocating for uh, Chinese 
women and, and uh, uh, locally born Chinese as the future of Jamaica had some earlier writings in which he pretty much says the same thing about the aspiring black middle class, that they really represent the morality of the nation. Um, so it wasn't necessarily whiteness per se, but it was these kinds of constructions of modernity, um, morality, respectability that get infused because of course there's that aspirational element of um, the black Jamaican class later. Um, and I think, you know, when you look across to Cuba from the very beginning, the, um, the, the concept of Asians and whiteness was very much contradictory where Asians were brought in because they were legally constructed as white. They were counted in the census as white initially, but socially on the ground, they always were uh, treated as non-white um, in, in, in social arenas through baptisms. They didn't need to get permission to marry outside of their group. Um, so it's, uh, I, I think there's still a lot of work to be done when you're talking about pan-Caribbean, but certainly those kinds of phenomenon can be found across Latin America and the Caribbean. Thank you. Yes, and um, and me, I, I actually believe that uh, this is a very important question also um, with a, for a different reason for me. And that is that uh, it seems that in places like the Dominican Republic, Whiteness has been so much in your face that it's become a sort of a given and that what has needed to be brought into the open is a non-whiteness and how non-whiteness uh, is, 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 is not only uh, fundamental uh, to any conception of Dominicanness, yeah, uh, but also, um, I mean, even at the level of... Uh, of, 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 of social action. Uh, I mean, the, the country has uh, has been built uh, by non-white people. Yeah, um, and um, in, uh, to 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 illustrate this, I just recall uh, for this uh, for a person who asked this uh, very important question, uh, a an exhibition at the Centro uh, Centro Cultural E Leon Jimenez, uh, known for short as Centro Leon in the city of Santiago de los Caballeros. Um, it's a permanent exhibit which has uh, perhaps uh, uh, representative of the Spanish heritage. It has the same thing for the Taino uh, uh, natives, uh, the indigenous population of the region. Um, and then it has an area which is covered uh, and, and, it's, and it has little little holes. And that area is uh, where the African legacy is. And uh, and you and in order to see it, you have to approach it and open up the little windows that the exhibit makes possible. And the statement that that exhibition is making is precisely how hidden uh, the African legacy uh, in the Indian Republic has been. Uh, to the point that in order for you to see it, despite the phenotype of the population, yeah, uh, that in order to see it, you have to look for it intentionally. <laughs> and, 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 you know, and I hope that that, that, uh, that says something uh, about why whiteness is not a really a, a significant concern so far. Maybe it should be, uh, but uh, you know, it's something I need to think more about. I, uh, there, there, there's a, a, a question um, for Patricia about the way whiteness is posed that makes non-white people seem a bit um, uh, easily manipulated. I don't know if you want to address that. Then I, and then I have a, a quick question for uh, Kathleen. I, uh, do you, how do you feel the, the silences about the a Asian identity, how does that complicate ideas of both whiteness and blackness in, in Cuban discourse? You know, there, there are lots of um, people who will tell you quite easily, 
of all the different mixtures that they are, but very lots of silences about people who who are, who are white Chinese. I mean, in popular discourse, in, in white white and Chinese, black and Chinese. So, um, just your thoughts on on what that means? That that sort of relative silence about the the, the Chinese, Patricia. Yeah, I think that that was the question I was referring to before. Oh, uh, I see. Oh, yeah, okay. which is about you know this disidentification from um, you know all of the stereotypical impositions on to, that have been made onto blackness and onto poverty because I think blackness and poverty really are very entangled in these discursive representations, and which is part of why a lot of the times we see a disidentification among the lower classes and sometimes even among um, non-whites themselves. So I think that's what I was referring to in, uh, before. But oh, if I may actually also ask a question to, to Professor Lopez, um, for some, you know, first of all, thank you so much for your presentation. So interesting and so enlightening. And my question in, in a way kind of contradicts what I've, I have said about, you know, looking at whiteness as a, a discursive and not just as phenotypical, because my question for you is about phenotype actually, is about mostly about hair. <laughs> um, I'm very curious to know, um, especially when you talk about the um, Afro-Cuban Chinese, um, both alliances, but also intermarriages, um, and, you know, across uh, part of the project of white supremacy in the hemisphere is also an aesthetic, um, that has an aesthetic dimension, right, of as, um, associating whiteness with beauty and blackness with ugliness. Um, and this connects to Silvio's point about the Tainos, right? And, and like, even though they are not white, they are beautiful. And that makes me also think of texture, right? So color and texture, are just as important. We think a lot of aesthetics as just visual, but of course, texture is a major part of aesthetics, right? So my question then is about if you, if in your research, you found anything about, um, you know, beauty, aesthetics, and and specifically about hair and hair texture of um, these Asian immigrants in, in your research, yeah. Thank you. Well, this question is actually also uh, linked to uh, uh, Professor James's question on uh, the silences. So for a long time, Chinese history and identity was indeed silenced within Cuban history, even as there was a collective knowledge about the role of Chinese in Cuban independence, actually fighting for Cuban independence. Um, and despite the efforts of the Chinese merchant community to promote themselves, um, and especially after the Cuban Revolution, when you know the idea was that uh, there would be an end to institutional racial discrimination, so there was no longer uh, this ability to emphasize one's own participation, for example, in a Chinese ethnic association. Um, coupled with that, many of the Chinese uh, Cuban community fled to uh, Miami, New Jersey, New York after the revolution, especially in the 60s and 70s, much like they were leaving Jamaica um, in the 1970s. So now it's, it's a very different situation today when the relationship between China and Cuba is, is strong diplomatically and uh, China gives economic aid to Cuba. Um, and so Cuba itself, the state, is recovering Chinese history within Cuba. And so now there's um, all kinds of uh, opportunities for younger mixed Cubans to research their family history. I met a lot of people when I was in the archive who were actually tracing a family member uh, to write about and to express that part of their identity that may have been hidden or subsumed or that they didn't know about. But where the complication, that was the question that was asked, where it complicates this idea is that now it can also represent a distancing from blackness in post-revolutionary Cuba. Right. And some um, people have actually critiqued, some people of Chinese descent who are also Afro-Cuban have critiqued that and said, you know, this shouldn't be seen as something I'm exceptional and I'm somehow different because, I'm, because I have this Chinese um, part of me. And that links up to the aesthetic because this is where the cultural studies and literature people have done a really wonderful job ex excavating across Latin America, the different tropes of um, 
mixed race Asian characters in Latin America, um, either portrayals in film and television or in novels. And in Cuba, the trope is La Mulata China. And it's a very exoticized, beautiful, um, you know, character who's, who is uh, non, not quite white, but not black either. And um, it, you know, it's of course a, a become like a stereotypical character um, that you even see today um, in, in discourse about Chinese Cubans. So it's something that, you know, fortunately, I think when, you know, someone had mentioned earlier that th this work is being done in Latin America. And so Cubans themselves are actually critiquing this and writing about it too. Thank you. Uh, Silvia, you have a, a comment? Yes, I, I, I just thought that the question uh, that, you, that you try to read, uh, it's, it's, it's asked, what is it? I thought it referred to a, the current government in Haiti. But uh -huh. not, it, it refers to noirisme. Uh, ah, noirisme. Noirisme, which is, which is basically uh, in a, a kind of Afrocentrism, uh, you know, of, of the kind that Duvalier practiced. Uh, but, uh, but one that actually does a great deal of harm to Blacks themselves, <laughs> you know. Um, and so uh, I, I, my, my answer to that question um, is that uh, Le Noir, uh, in, in Haiti has been as bad uh, for, the, for the population as the mulattoes. Yeah? So the, the advances and failures, I mean, uh, Duvalier actually uh, upheld the, uh, the banner of, of, of blackness without uh, uh, affirming uh, African descended uh, culture in the, in the country. Yeah, and so they, they no, they, this, are, this, this are just opportunistic. Uh, there, were, there were people in Haiti who, who, who viewed, uh, who viewed uh, the, the clash between the mulattoes and the blacks as a perennial struggle. And so basically this is just the taking one side huh? uh, from, which to, from which to compete with the other side, uh, both of whom are trying to take hold of power. Uh, and, but, but in the way of delivery, they have not differentiated uh, each other once they get to power. Okay, thank you. Unfortunately, there are a couple of questions, one for Sylvia, one for, 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 for Kathleen, and I think a couple others that we're going to have to leave unanswered because the clock is ticking fast. Thank you all very much. Nice to see you, even though it's just, you know, via Zoom and maybe one day soon. Thank you. Thank you, <laughs> Thank you everyone. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks Thank to you. presenters, Professors Kathleen Lopez, Silvio Torres Sarian, and Patricia Pino for really excellent presentations and discussion stimulating stimulating a lot of thoughts about whiteness and the Asian demographic in Jamaica and Cuba, whiteness and perceptions of Africans and indigenous populations, and the complexity of race thinking historically in Hispaniola and Cuba, class, race, and whiteness, and whiteness studies in Brazil. Uh, so thank you for all of that and for many interrelated issues. And thank you, our audience. We look forward to welcoming you soon to our third conversation and to other last events. I want to say also that I am the face here, but there is an active LASK team behind all of this. Students from the LASK Graduate Collective undergraduate, minor and certificate students, our graduate assistant, Victor Hernandez, associate director, Eric Tomala, all key figures in organization for today and always in organization of LASK events. For further information about LASK events, you may contact us at lask at umd.edu. Thank you again, everyone, for participating today. Goodbye and be safe.